Welcome back, folks, to Wrestle Rant, where I give my in-depth analysis of all the pay-per-views that I watch in the WWE Network. Over the course of the month of September, I will be reviewing past Night of Champions shows in honor of Night of Champions this month. I'll be putting up reviews every Tuesday and Saturday, and um, today I'll be reviewing Vengeance Night of Champions 2007. And it's not a part of the official lineage of the Night of Champions pay-per-view, but because they have the Night of Champions theme, I thought I'd review it just for the hell of it. So with that being said, a few news and notes here. Um, for one thing, I do sound a little bit congested. I've been uh, uh, sick for the last couple of days, so if I sound congested over the course of this video, I apologize. And it won't be just this video either. I'll be reviewing uh, the 07, 08, 09, and 2010 videos. I'll be doing all of those videos, all of those pay-per-views. Um, over the next couple of days, I've already watched all of them. I watched those four pay-per-views in the last few days alone. Um, how I found the time, I have no fucking idea, but I reviewed those shows, or I will be reviewing those shows, like, more as of today and tomorrow, so you'll be seeing me wearing the same NWO shirts, I don't think I'm wearing the same shirt every single fucking week, um, I'm taping more shows in one day than, a, than TNA, I, I guess you can make that comparison, but, anyway, we'll get right down to it. Vengeance out of Champions 2007 kicked off with the World Tag Team Championships on the line, Lance Cade and Trevor Murdoch defending against the Hardy Boys, Jeff and Matt. So the background behind this matchup was that when the Hardys were a World Tag Team Champions had a long feud going with the uh, with the duo of Cade and Murdoch, they defended the titles against them at Backlash and won. Same thing at Judgment Day. They had a great ladder match at One Night Stand 07, not between these two teams, but the Hardys and the World's Greatest Tag Team, which I did review cheap plug up here in the channel, One Night Stand 2007, if you want to check it out. Um, very good matchup there. Lance Kidd and Trevor Murdoch would win the belts one night later on Monday Night Raw, setting up the need for a rematch at this pay-per-view. So, it was a good matchup. These two teams have always worked well together. This, this was when the tag team division in WWE was still relevant. Um, Kidd and Murdoch, I always thought, I, I always thought we were a very good tag team. I thought they broke up too prematurely in 2008. Um, it set the tone for Lance Kidd's career. He went on to be the protege of Chris Jericho and his feud against Shawn Michaels before he was unceremoniously released later that year in R.I.P. Lance Cade. As for Trevor Murdoch, after they broke up, he was drafted over to SmackDown before never making his debut over there and getting released. So that kind of sucked. But um, as a tag team, I thought these two were great. They go over here, still your world tag team champions. The Hardys, I think, would not really break or, or not break up or split after this, but they would kind of part ways, and Matt Hardy would go after the U.S. Championship on SmackDown, which I also reviewed, Great American Match 07, if you want to check that out, cheap plug, and Jeff Hardy would go on to feud for the Intercontinental Championship as well. So a good opening matchup with Caden Murdoch going over. Up next, we have the Cruiserweight Championship on the line, Chavo Guerrero defending the title against Jimmy Wang Yang. Now, Jimmy Wang Yang was a guy um, that was a very entertaining athlete. A lot of people liked him, always got good reactions. So looking back on it now, I always, you know, make fun of Jimmy Wang Yang with my little brother because he was like a bona fide jobber for all the years that he was in WWE. But he's an example of a guy that was a great wrestler, a great cruiserweight. Could he have been a world champion? Absolutely not. But he was a guy, um, I, I don't know if his name was Akio or Akayo, or I can't exactly, I'm sorry if I, you know, botched the, uh, the pronunciation of his name, of his, uh, the, the name that he used to go by. But then they give him him this you know, Asian redneck gimmick, which was absolutely stupid. It was not going to get anywhere. But the guy made chicken salad out of chicken sit, out of chicken shit. It was a great, uh, you know, turn of events for Jimmy Wang Yang. Like I said, was he ever going to be a world champion? Absolutely not. But a lot of people loved him. He was a lovable loser. He was on a roll at the time, defeating Chavo Guerrero and winning multiple matches, becoming, becoming the number one contender to the WWE Cruiserweight Championship. He would ultimately come up short on the show, but it was a very good match. But the fact that he got 10 minutes, even more time than half the matches, actually, oh, he, that matchup got more time than every single matchup except the main event for the uh, for the WWE title, which is pretty surprising. But that being said, though, it was a very good matchup from Jimmy Wang Yang and Chavo Guerrero. Why Jimmy Wang Yang never got his run with the Cruiserweight title before the title was retired, I have no idea. Um, of course, it would end up giving that title to Hornswoggle, the next month at Great American Bash, which I also reviewed as well, like I said before. But yeah, good matchup from Chavo and Jimmy Wang Yang. Uh, just a fun, uh, something that I pointed out while watching this contest was the fact that Jimmy Wang Yang shares the same in-ring attire as Dean Ambrose nowadays does, uh, which is pretty comical. I know Luke Harper has the, you know, the wife beater and jeans as well, but I had completely forgotten that Jimmy Wang Yang had the, uh, had the uh, same attire as Dean Ambrose does now, which is pretty comical, you know, thinking back on it. And considering how over Dean Ambrose is and as big of a star as he is now, and Jimmy Wang Yang wasn't, unfortunately. Because he gave him a shitty gimmick, but like I said, he made the most of it. 
Up next now for the ECW Championship, Johnny Nitro taking on CM Punk. Now, as the legend goes, not as the legend goes, as it used to go, as, as it was, um, the matchup was supposed to be Chris Benoit against CM Punk. Now, as the legend goes, now it's applicable, Chris Benoit was supposed to win that ECW Championship. I'm pretty sure that's been confirmed um, after the title was stripped of Bobby Lashley when he was drafted on Monday Night Raw in the 2007 WWE Draft. Uh, they held the tournament to crown a new champion. CM Punk and Chris Benoit made it to the finals. But of course, with what happened with all the you know the Benoit tragedy um, that weekend and Benoit no-showed the pay-per-view, they replaced him at the last minute with one of ECW's newest acquisitions, Johnny Nitro, who would later become unknown as John Morrison. So with that being said, first of all, I just want to say Benoit and Punk would have had a fuck, a hell of a matchup. Um, it, it, I just get excited just thinking about it because it would have been such a great contest and it's such a shame everything went down the way it did. I mean, it doesn't matter the match or not. I mean, the fact that people's lives were lost was are bad is bad in of itself. But the fact that this matchup was never really got to happen, never really came to fruition, which is also disappointing because it could have been one hell of a matchup. But anyway, though, Johnny Nitro replaced him. Um, him and CM Punk had a good matchup, not a great matchup. And the thing with this matchup was was that much like the Great American Bash match they had the following month, which I also watched. Um, is the fact that CM Punk shit on his DVD a couple of years ago that him and Morrison slash Nitro never really had great chemistry together in the ring. So that kind of took away from this matchup for me, and I could definitely see why this matchup was like the clunkier of the ones that I've seen. They had a great 50 minutes of fame match on ECW a couple of months later in September. But this matchup, their bash matchup, the SummerSlam matchup, which I have yet to see, were not all that great. I thought this was not a good matchup. It, it was decent for what it was. Um, it would it, it would have been a good matchup in any other show, but the fact you know, given the fuck, given the fact that it's fucking CM Punk and the fact that he's having ten times better matches, uh, after this you know beforehand, is the fact that it, this is not one of the better matches of CM Punk's career. Maybe for Johnny Nitro slash John Morrison, but definitely not for CM Punk. But Johnny Nitro emerges victorious as your new ECW champion. Whether he was more ready, whether he was ready, or if that's even a word, I don't think it is. Whether he was more ready than CM Punk for the ECW Championship, I wouldn't say so. But it put CM Punk in chase mode and made people want to see him win that belt that much more. And it meant that much more when he eventually did win it on that episode of ECW in September of that year. So that's that. Up next, Intercontinental Championship matchup. Santino Morella taking on Umaga. Um, it was Umaga that Santino defeated to win that belt in April of that year in Italy. The debuting Santino Morella. So the highly anticipated rematch on this show... It really wasn't much of a match at all. Umaga dominated Santino. The match went all of two minutes before Umaga intentionally, and not intentionally, but unintentionally got himself disqualified when he was just beating the living shit out of Santino in the corner, you know, giving Santino the victory and having him retain the Intercontinental Championship. Now, Umaga would win back the title eight days later on Raw anyway. Santino was never really booked as, an, as, as a great IC champion. Yes, he had a memorable debut, but the reign as IC champion was pretty much a glorified joke. Uh, but anyway, though, this was not really a much of a match at all, so really nothing to talk about here except for the fact that Umaga was an absolute beast. And why they ruined him, I have no idea. I think he still he was still hot at this point at, at this point in time as a heel, but um, they never really utilized him all that well when he went over to SmackDown the following year in that 2008 draft. But anyway, though, up next for the United States Championship, MVP defending against Ric Flair. Decent matchup. I can't really remember the background this matchup had. I know Ric Flair had just been drafted to SmackDown a couple of weeks earlier. So maybe that's why I knew they would face off, I think, in 2008 as well when Ric Flair was in that whole retirement angle. But this was a good matchup. Really nothing of notes. I mean, it was decent for what it was. Really no story behind it. But MVP utilizing dirty tactics to retain the United States Championship. So still your U.S. Champion. It would have been too early to take the title off of him anyway, considering the fact he just beat Benoit for it about a month earlier, so there was really no chance or really no incentive from, from the fans to really care about it because they knew the MVP would be retaining in this contest. Up next, for the WWE Tag Team Championships, Deuce and Domino taking on Sergeant Slaughter and Jimmy Superfly Snuka. Now, the story with this contest is that uh, Deuce and Domino had issued an open challenge and these former tag team champions, not, not, not tag team champions, not former tag team champions, but these legends of the business accepted the invitation. And something that confused me was the fact that Sim Snuka, um, I think Deuce, or, yeah, Deuce, because Domino is Cliff's Compton, I, from what I can recall, I can't, I can never w remember which one is which, I think Deuce, um, with Sim Snuka, is related to Jimmy Superfly Snuka, so the fact that he faced his father or his relative, or however he's related to him, I think he's his father or his uncle, 
um, was pretty comical. I know the, the commentators did not make mention of that, and why would they? That wasn't his gimmick at the time. He wasn't Sim Snuka. He was Deuce. Uh, but I thought that was pretty cool, though. The matchup, for what it was, for the six minutes it, it got, was pretty enjoyable, considering the fact that Sergeant Slaughter and Jimmy Superfly Snuka were involved. But the guys could still go for the raids at this point in time, so they had a good showing. The WWE Tag Team Champions, Deuce and Domino, obviously retained here, so decent matchup for what it was. Up next, we had Edge and Batista for the World Heavyweight Championship in a last chance match. Now, Batista had come up short here. He would never, ever be able to again contend for the World Heavyweight Championship while Edge was still champion. Now, the thing with the stipulation, the whole thing with this feud, was that Edge went over on Batista every single time, which I don't think is a bad thing. If anything, it helped establish Edge as a top star. Granted, his feud with John Cena in 2006 kind of already, kind of already accomplished that, but as a star on SmackDown, this was kind of when it was evident that Edge was taking the ball and running with it on SmackDown as its new top star on the blue brand. So having him defeat Batista for you know three consecutive times, I thought was the best course of action. They had a very good matchup here like they were known to do. Not their best showing. I thought their steel cage matchup from one night stand was better. But this was still a good matchup from Edge and Batista. It had a shitty finish with Edge emerging victorious via countout. It wasn't restarted. I thought it would get restarted. Um, from what I remember, they had a blow-off to this feud a couple of weeks later on SmackDown, or that Friday night on SmackDown, <clears throat> they would have a non-title matchup in which Batista finally got his um, vengeance over Edge and would emerge victorious. But um, anyway, though, Edge emerge victorious here, still your World Heavyweight Champion. So kind of a shitty ending to the matchup, I wasn't really a fan of that. But the stipulation wasn't really all that relevant anyway. Because anyway, Batista, a month later, would still be contending for the World Heavyweight Championship. His edge would be injured a few weeks later. Batista would once again re-enter the World Heavyweight title picture with the Great Khali. So the stipulation of, the, of a last chance match was pretty stupid. Um, it would have been better had Batista never been able to contend for the World title at all. But they were obviously going to do that. But the thing with like last chance matches and like if I win, you're never able to re you know contend for this title while I'm still holding it. I've never really been a fan of those stipulations, if only the fact that after they do that, that champion drops her title only a few weeks later anyway. Like, not a few weeks later, but like maybe the month or two after that. So the stipulation is really null and void by that point in time, so that's why I've never really been a, a fan of a last chance matchup, in my personal opinion anyway. But, um, if, if like, if it happened during when CM Punk was champion for that year long that he was champion, it would have made sense. I, mean, I know people didn't know that at the time, but even still, though, it would have made more sense that, uh, no, you couldn't challenge it for the title for a year as opposed to like a month later because uh, you know the last chance here for Batista was stupid. And I mean, I, like I said, they didn't know at the time, but he would get injured a few weeks later and then he'd be back in the title picture anyway. So that was kind of a joke. But good matchup from Edge and Batista. Not their best showing, but still a good matchup nevertheless. Up next for the Women's Championship, Candice Michelle taking on Melina. Um, these two had a very good feud going on the women's division side, on the Raw side, I should say. Um, their matches were better than expected. This was only four minutes long. I think it should have gone longer. But based off their one-night stand matches and Great American matches from what I've seen, they have good chemistry together. I mean, Candice Michelle was not the strongest entering worker, but she had to come a long way from her, uh, not total Divas days, what the fuck am I thinking, Diva Search days, and eventually becoming the new WWE Women's Champion. So that was pretty cool. Candice Michelle emerging victorious here as the new Women's Champion. Um, they would eventually have a rematch at the Great American Bash pay-per-view a month later. Up next, and in the main event for the WWE World Heavyweight Championship, or just the WWE title as it was known at the time. I'm, I'm just mixing it up with nowadays. Um, a five-pack challenge featuring the then-champion John Cena, Mick Foley of all people, Bobby Lashley, Randy Orton, and King Booker. Now, the matchup, the whole background of this contest, it said on Wikipedia that it was it's listed at 18 minutes, but I can clearly recall watching this and it was only about 10 so maybe this is wrong or i'm just drunk or something i don't know i maybe i'm just seeing things but i could have recalled that um this matchup was only about 10 minutes when i was watching it on the pay-per-view but anyway though um john cena the whole thing with, with the, the background going into this was that john cena had been holding the championship since unforgiven the, the earlier um in late 2006 these four former champions in the mcfoley bobby lashley randy orton and king booker it was a clash of the champions, so to speak, and no pun intended on the former WCW pay-per-view name. But with this being a night of champions, it was like the ultimate culmination of all the best champions on the Raw brand um, coinciding for the WWE Championship in this one matchup. Now, the match itself was really nothing of note. They had good chemistry with one another, but early on, it was really just, you know, more, it was really just a one-on-one -on -one altercation between people in the ring. And it wouldn't really boil down until... 
Um, it wouldn't really get all that exciting until the final few minutes when everyone was really hitting their finishers. And in the end, John Cena pinned Mick Foley to retain the WWE title. Now, I know Mick Foley has come back, you know, a handful of times over the years to the ring um, since his retirement match with Triple H in 2002, or 2000, I'm sorry, um, as Cactus Jack at WrestleMania 2000 before, you know, that whole debacle. But he's come back so many times in his matchup with Randy Orton, as he said before, at Backlash 2004 should have been his last matchup. His matchup against Edge at WrestleMania 22 should have been his last match. So why he was brought back for this contest, I have no idea. Maybe to sell some more pay-per-view buys. I have no idea who, who could have possibly seen Mick Foley as a possible threat to the championship in 2007 or could have seen him as a uh, as a possibility to see him as champion at this point in time. It really wasn't all that plausible. But um, he was a nice addition to the match. He didn't really do much. But considering the fact this was one of his final matches in WWE, I know he would wrestle in the 2008 Royal Rumble. He had um, the 2012 Royal Rumble, of course, a couple of years ago. And that would end up being his final matchup in the WWE before he eventually retired from the ring um, for good, eventually, you know, due to the doctor's advice, heeding the doctor's advice. But uh, this would not be Mick Foley's best showing in the ring. But like I said, he was a nice addition to the contest. And it would build towards Bobby Lassie versus John Cena at the Great American Bash pay-per-view. And it was funny, too, because watching this back after John Cena emerges victorious, he's going up against four different guys, four different challengers in Booker, in Orton, in Lashley, and Foley. And to see John Cena emerge victorious again, because like I said, he had been champion since September of 2006 by this point, was very tiresome for a lot of people because a lot of people just wanted to see the title taken off of him at this point in time. But that being said, though, a good matchup. Really didn't live up to my expectations, but with that being said, though, it was good for what it was. So that closed off the Night of Champions pay-per-view and just a few other uh, news and notes from this show. We also had the entire coverage of the Mr. McMahon death angle on this show because it was a few weeks earlier at the 2007 WWE draft. Then Mr. McMahon was blown up in the limo and that whole stupid angle. And there was, of course, later that week, this week of this pay-per-view, that the whole Chris Benoit tragedy happened. So it was very bad timing, very in bad taste. And it should have never happened in the, in the first place, regardless of whether the Benoit stuff happened or not. But um, that being said, though, that should have never really happened. It was a complete joke. But um, the, the fact they really they focused more on that over the course of this pay-per-view rather than the in-ring action kind of took it away from it for me, especially knowing what would happen with the Mr. McMahon death angle. They put a lot of time into that, a lot of effort, and it would you know amount to nothing since the whole Benoit thing happened like a day later. But that being said, though, um, that really took up a lot of the airtime on this show as well as, and this is something about the pay-per-view that I really, really liked, and that it was the first ever Night of Champions show. Not officially, it was the 08 edition. That was the first official installment of the series of pay-per-views. This was just kind of a, a theme show for a Vengeance pay-per-view. And this would end up being the final Vengeance pay-per-view until the disastrous 2011 installment a couple of years ago. But one thing that I really liked about the show was that before every matchup, and every matchup was a title match, every title was up for grabs. And this was at a time in WWE when we had... Nine different titles on the line. We had the World Tag Team titles, Cruiserweight, ECW, Intercontinental, United States, Tag Team, World Heavyweight, Women's, and WWE Championships. So we had so many titles that having this kind of show at the time would pop a buy rate. It was interesting because very very rarely, or if ever, did we see or did we have a pay-per-view that every active championship was on the line. And nowadays, I mean, now that we have Night of Champions, I still like Night of Champions. It's still one of my favorite pay-per-views. Maybe not really. I mean, with WrestleMania and Money in the Bank and all those other shows, TLC, I even like more now than the Night of Champions because the Night of Champions doesn't really mean as much as it once did, um, especially with this show. Like I said before, I forgot to mention it, but before each of the championship matches, they would show a video package of a former uh, of a former famous person that held that championship. I know we were for the Intercontinental Championship. I can't remember who they had, but... Um, they might have had, uh, oh, they had IRS, they had Mike Rotundo, I think, or they had Dean Malenko for the Cruiserweight Championship, Mike Rotundo, a.k.a. IRS, for the WWE Tag Team title match, they had him sitting at ringside, and granted, they would cover people that were already a part of the company as agents and such, there wasn't really any big returns, like for the WWE title, they wouldn't have a return by, like, Bruno or something, but um, it, still, it, it, did deal, it, it still did add a lot to each of the matches and the prestige of each championship. Because at this point in time, the titles were extremely pre prestigious, but they were a lot more prestigious than they are nowadays, and it really added a lot to the championships, it added a lot more meaning to the matches, and the appearances by the Legends at ringside really helped add to the feel of the pay-per-view as a whole, and it's something that I wish the WWE would do nowadays with their current Night of Champions shows, 
And they stopped doing it the following year at Night of Champions 08. So this was really just a one-off thing that they did with the, the video packages and giving the spotlight to each of the titles. They haven't done it since. It was only a one-time thing, and I never really knew it. That I, re- I never really knew that they did it until this point in time. But as a whole, though, aside from that, this really wasn't all that newsworthy of a show. We had a new ECW champion crowned because there had to be because it was for the vacant ECW title. But aside from that, the only real title that changed hands was the women's championship. But the WWE title was retained. The World Heavyweight title, tag team, World Tag Team, WWE tag team. US, IC, and Cruiserweight. So it would have helped if we got a few more title changes on this show with nine titles being up for grabs. But um, it wasn't a bad show. It was just kind of, I wouldn't even say lackluster. It was just kind of more boring than anything. So a lot of these matches didn't really stand out as being great. Um, the World Tag Team match was good. Cruiserweight was fun. Nitro and Punk was lackluster. Santino and Umaga wasn't really much of a match. More of an angle than anything. MVP and Ric Flair, decent same thing with the WWE Tag Team title match. Edge and Batista had a solid matchup, but like I said before, that wasn't as good as some of their past battles have been. Candice Michelle and Molina made the most of the four minutes they had, and the main event really didn't live up to expectations at all. But um, I wouldn't recommend going out of your way to watch this show, but if you are a big Night of Champions fan and want to get a feel of what the feel of this pay-per-view used to be back in 2007 when they gave more spotlight to each of the championships then feel free to go back and watch this show. But that's going to do it for my review of the WWE Vengeance Night of Champions 2007 pay-per-view. Um, I will be reviewing Night of Champions 08, 09, 2010, 2011, 2012, and 2013 in coming weeks. Um, as of this, I've already watched the 08, 09, and 2010 shows. I still have to go back and watch 2011, unfortunately, which was a terrible show, so I have to go back and watch that and suffer through sitting those three hours. But the 2012 show was great. The 2013 show sucked, um, but those will be coming out in the weeks ahead as we approach Night of Champions 2014. I think the only show that will air, my edition of WrestleRant for the 2013 review of Night of Champions will go up after Night of Champions this year. I think it's going to go up on the Tuesday afterwards, if my scheduling is correct. But um, aside from that, though, all the other pay-per-views will be up within the next couple of weeks. So with that being said, thanks for watching, folks. Always appreciate the support. Make sure you like, comment, and subscribe. I'm Graham Jason Matthews, and I'll catch you guys next week.